Muslim woman's life represents a scary mystery in most of the West non-Muslim imagination. A gloomy patriarchal system seems to be controlling over her life. But this image has a long history. Beside the great effect of the patriarchal customs that affected many interpretations of Islam, the Muslim world faced a horrible shock during the colonization era. Women were not safe. They were raped in the streets by the soldiers. And that led the society to work more on protecting women. It was even hard to think of sending grown-up girls to schools. Each man played his role of protection for women in his family. And for women, that was exactly what they needed at that time. Eventually, the idea became as a part of the culture. For example, a good man with a protected family was a man with a completely secluded females of his family. Yes, ignorance became like a fact. And only the needy women would keep on working to bring money. In time, ignorance turned those women who liked being protected from the cruel soldiers and the unsecured streets into ignorant creatures who knew nothing about the rights guaranteed to them by their own religion. In time, the whole way of life turned to be part of the culture and the original reasons were forgotten. Everything was always kept in the top sacred shell of religion just to protect it. Still, there were cases of educated women, daughters and wives those who were brought up by educated men who knew their obligations toward their women folk. Those men were like scholars or highly educated men. And still, there was a respectful number of women who memorized Quran very well. When the talk about freeing women started, it came from the West, and it seemed to be like part of a long speech of colonialism. It was strongly resisted in the name of religion simply because it seemed to be westernization rather than freedom. And for the leaders of this freedom movement, the very clear outlook of a Muslim woman seemed to be like a bold sign of oppression. And they went on one way, we have to stop this. This stereotype urged them to do something to help those women. And after ages of trying, the fact came to tell them that those women who refused to replace the religion by any other ideology still refuse any exported or inherited ideas to free them. Facts are telling the world that the Muslim woman suffers from those who does not respect her beliefs, like those who twist the meaning of Islam to put her in an inferior state. It seems clear that all what they need is living within true Islamic rules. But surprisingly, no one cares to know what are those rules, what are the beliefs and regulations those women are demanding. They went on one way, Islam is oppressing women and the only way out is to omit it. And they forgot even to find answers for the multiple questions rounding around the Muslim women's life. Actually, to answer any of these questions, you need to explore a huge background of a Muslim thinking. And that is why we will consider it our mission for the coming 50 minutes. We will explore the huge background and mindset of any Muslim, either a man or a woman. You might be surprised if you knew that among each five people, you might meet one Muslim. Muslims represent about 20% of people living on this planet, and only 15% of them are Arabs. So the majority are not Arabs. I think those numbers might represent very good reason to encourage anyone to know something about what do Muslims believe in. And the whole thing can simply be summarized if we highlighted the meaning of Islam, the six beliefs that every Muslim has to believe in, and the five deeds that every Muslim has to apply. In the Arabic language, any word must be a branch of another root word. Those root words consist of three letters, four letters in rare cases. The word Islam is derived from the root word Salama. This root word is the same root for other words like submission, purity, and peace. Istislam, Salama, Salam. The meaning of the word Islam is formed of these three mentioned words submission, purity, and peace. If a person fully submits himself or herself to the Almighty God alone, worshiping Him purely, 
he or she will live in peace and harmony in this life and in the life after. So, a Muslim is someone who submits to God purely? Literally, a Muslim is not the follower of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Literally, a Muslim is someone who submits to God purely, worshipping him alone, associating no other partners with him. This definition includes everyone who submitted to God and followed his regulations revealed through his prophets at any time. At the time of Noah's, those who submitted to God and followed his messenger were Muslims? Yes. At the time of Moses, those who submitted to God and followed his messenger were Muslims? Yes. At the time of Jesus, those who submitted to God and followed his messenger were Muslims? Yes. At the time of Muhammad, the same, yes. All those who submitted to God, associating no other partners with him at the time of their prophets, are Muslims. Before talking about any beliefs, we have to talk first about five relevant issues that are highly important to Muslims. First, every human being is born with a ready nature to submit to God. Muslims believe that submission to God is part of any human being's inner nature. We may liken the human being here to a computer set, which is manufactured with a simple software allowing it to submit to God. The only difference here is that we are supplied with free choice. We can choose either to click on the icon and run the program or not. This leads us to the second point, which is that Human beings have free choice. I chose to be here talking to you, and you chose to be sitting there listening to me. I choose my dress, I choose what I eat, what I drink, whatever I do is my choice. Our deeds are our choices. It's true that we don't choose when we are born or when we will die or in which culture we live, but our deeds and our beliefs are a matter of our choice. For Muslims, beliefs are a matter of the heart and the mind, and these are free elements that have complete freedom of choice. No compulsion in religion. This is the third point, and those are not my words. Actually, no compulsion in religion is part of verse 256 in Quran chapter 2. God here is stating that no one can ever force another person to believe in something under any condition. This verse came as a defense for one of the Jewish youths. I'll tell you. Before Islam, some families, when they didn't get boys, they made a vow that if they got one, they would Judaize him. Later, when those families embraced Islam, they tried to force their children to embrace Islam. But God defended them by this verse, no compulsion in religion. Freedom of a choice is what God defended here. Free choice of belief is something that no one can argue against. Even if someone thinks that he could force another to a certain belief, this would never work because who may control the heart and the mind of a person? Fourth, people are born without any inherited sin. If somebody's father took a bribe, then the police came to accuse the son with the father because he must have some inherited genes urging him to commit the same crime as his father. Would the son accept? Would that be fair at all? For Muslims, inheritance happened for lands, assets, money, but never for sins. No one may ever be punished because someone else had sinned. One of God's names is the just. Muslims believe that God never judges anyone according to his father's faults, or to his grandfather's faults, or to his grand-grandfather's faults. And God is making it clear, saying that which means that no bearer of burdens shall bear the burdens of another. For Muslims thus, there is nothing so called the original sin, and if there would be, this original sin would be that of Satan, when he refused to prostrate to Adam out of racism. Being Satan, he thought he was better than Adam. He was made of fire, while Adam was made of clay. Racism was the sin for which Satan was expelled of paradise forever. 
which leads us to the fifth and the last point. No supremacy or people are equal. No supremacy means that no one is better than the other in the sight of God except for piety. Not for differences in color, nationality, luxury, nothing, nothing except piety. As all human beings are from Adam, and Adam is from earth, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, there is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, or for a non-Arab over an Arab, or for the white over the black, or for the black over the white, except for piety. Now, as we covered all the relevant issues, we may start talking about the six main beliefs that every Muslim has to believe in. In the first chapter in the Old Testament, in the Arabic Christian Bible, try to count how many times it is mentioned in only one paragraph. Six times, and 17 times in the first whole page, and hundreds of times in the whole book. Muslims believe that Allah, the One, is unique alone is the creator the sustainer of all that exists doesn't father nor is born he doesn't need both of them and unlike his creation he's perfect in every way is neither like nor in his creation I would like to stop at this name, the Creator. The concept that the whole world was created by one God is an idea that many believers and great philosophers reached. In the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the alteration of the night and the day, there are signs for people of understanding. We will show our signs to them in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Is it not sufficient that your Lord witnesses all things? Against this concept of creation stands the concept that the whole universe was created by accident. If I drop this glass of water, what should I expect? The glass will smash into tiny randomly shaped pieces, right? Would I expect it to turn into tiny glasses of different kinds of juice? Sounds hard to believe. Would you believe me if I told you that if I dropped a bottle of ink that I will have perfect drawings? And if it happened for once, will it ever become such a repetitive result for such an action? Then how would an explosion that happened by accident to result into these creatures that work and live in harmony.
if I told you that the TV in your room is just a matter of atomic collection in the air that exploded and came out working as a TV, would that sound logical for you or for anyone? Then how may anyone think that the eye is just a machine that came out by accident? In the healthy eye, the lens is clear and allows light to pass through. Light is focused by the corona and the lens onto a thin layer of tissue called the retina. The retina works like a film in a camera. When the light hits the retina, tiny cells collect the light signals and convert them into electrical signals which are then sent through the optic nerve and to the brain in almost one of the darkest points in the body where they are processed into 3D colorful and bright images we see. If this works for an eye, then how about all other machines working in one body, each with its complicated machinery, all in harmony, serving each other? Here, we have to stop and think. If Almighty God created all these entire machines in our body, working in harmony to support our lives. Then why? What is the purpose of our lives? Why did Allah create us from the beginning? I haven't created the jinn and humankind, except that they should worship me. Muslims believe that the only purpose of their existence on earth is worshiping God, 24-7 of worshiping. And that is the only purpose. That must be a joke. Who is that human being that could keep on worshipping for 24-7? Give me a break. Actually, it will not sound like a joke if you understood what is worshipping from Islam's point of view. It's not the only commonly known worshipping like other religions. Praying, fasting, pilgrimage. Yes, yes, those rituals are of extreme importance, but worshipping as a full meaning of Islam is any lawful deed that we do with good intentions. That is to mean if you kept on worshipping all day and night to show off in front of your family or your friends that you're a religious person, then you will not be worshipping. While if you were eating just to preserve the health God gave you, then you will be worshipping. Even the intimate relationship is worshipping. By the way, these are not my words. Prophet Muhammad himself said that doing a good thing is a charity and forbidding a bad thing is a charity. Even the intimate relationship between a husband and a wife is a charity. At that time, the companions were surprised and just asked him, how could that be possible? He simply clarified this point by saying that if you're punished by doing it in a wrong way, then you must be rewarded if you're doing it in a correct way. A lawful deed must be accompanied by good intention that pleases Allah. Concerning this meaning, a simple joke that you tell someone in order to cheer him or her up for the sake of Allah, needing nothing from this one, would be considered as worshipping that is why Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Your smile in your brother's face is a charity. And he stated it clear that it's all about intention when he said, Verily, deeds are rewarded by intention, and everyone will have the reward for that which he has intended. The second belief is believing in angels, creatures created by God. Though they're different from us, they were created from light. They have no free will, which means they follow Allah's orders perfectly well. They never do mistakes and they are never disobedient. These creatures have specific tasks to be done, such as carrying messages to the messengers of God, protecting human beings, recording our deeds 
and many other things. To be a Muslim, you have to believe in all the books of Allah, Torah, Gospel, and the Quran. In the Quran, Allah is saying, Surely we did send down the Torah. Therein was guidance and light, by which the prophets who submitted themselves to Allah's will judged the Jews. And two verses after he said, we sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we gave him the gospel, in which was guidance and light and confirmation of the Torah that had come before it, a guidance and admonition for the pious. Muslims believe that Allah, the same only God and sender of messages, sent to humankind, the only receiver, the same message through all his messengers and with every revelation all these messages were carried 100% correct by Gabriel. The only book that had maintained its original language, its divinely revealed language, is Quran. Quran was sent in Arabic, still is in Arabic, and the Arabic language is still a dominant language in many countries. If someone gave you a book saying, this is an English Quran, please correct him, telling him that this is an English translation of the Quran. It is one of a series of revelations, but is the last one. It is the main source of faith and practice for every Muslim. It deals with all subjects that concern human beings, including wisdom, doctrine, worship, law, and its basic two themes are the relationship between God and his creatures and relations between people. Quran provide guidelines for a just society, a proper human conduct, and equitable economic principles. So, what is it that we're talking about here? What is it that deals with everything in our lives? It's a constitution. It must be. Islam is not a religion that can be kept in mosques or just for Fridays. It is a way of life. A way of life that goes with humans in every single detail. It associates communities. A frame of life in which the individual and the community are of the same level of importance. And both the materialistic and spiritual needs are equally respected. Let me introduce to you the Quran through the first chapter. All praises be to Allah, the Lord of the world, the compassionate, the merciful, King of the day of judgment. You alone we worship, and to you alone we turn for help. Give us to the straight path, the path of whom you favored, not of those who have incurred your anger, nor of those who have gone astray. Amen. One of the most remarkable things about the Quran is the association of signs to it. Allah says in chapter 20, verse 114, but say, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. The principle of demanding of increase was only mentioned for once in the Quran. This demand was not just for power, money, children, or anything else. It was only for knowledge. Muslims in the early ages of Islam, those who fully applied the meaning of the Quran, showed us a great examples of science in the modern science up till today. Jaber ibn Hayyan was a prominent polymath, a chemist and alchemist, astronomer and astrologer, engineer, geologist, philosopher, psychist, pharmacist and physician. He is considered by some to be the father of chemistry. 
Jaber ibn Hayyan is held to be the first practical alchemist. Al Khwarizmi, or Algorithm, was a Persian mathematician, astronomer, and geographer, a scholar in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. He is considered the founder of algebra. Ibn Sina, commonly known in English as Avicenna, the very well-known Persian physician who authored the Canon of Medicine and the Book of Healing. His writings were considered the authority on medicine for over 500 years. He also was an astronomer, chemist, geologist, Islamic psychologist, and Islamic scholar. And Al Zahrawi, known for the West as Albucasus, was an Andalusian Arab physician, surgeon, chemist, and scientist. He is considered the greatest medieval surgeon and one of the fathers of modern surgery. He invented many surgery tools that are still in use. And his book, Kitab al Tasrif, was considered for perhaps five centuries during the European Middle Ages as the primary source for European medical knowledge and served as a reference for doctors and surgeons. Of course, Quran is not a book of science. However, many scientific discoveries were discovered during the last century. They claim to be new to humanity, while many of them were gently mentioned in Quran in a way that may suit human understanding in different ages. Let's take mountains for an example. For ages, people thought that mountains are those huge land forms over the surface of the earth. They were thought to be useful in preventing the sky from falling down on earth. Or maybe another benefit, which is to extract raw materials from them. Would it look better if the earth's surface was straight? But during the last century, Frank Press, in his book, Earth, likened the mountains to wedges, the greater part of which remains underneath the surface of the Earth. In his book, he explained the function of the mountains. He drew special attention to their important role in stabilizing the crust of the Earth. Have we not made the Earth as wide expanse? and the mountains as pegs. And we have placed on the earth firm mountains, lest it should shake with them. At a time when people thought that the earth was flat, when they thought that the sun and the moon are revolving around the earth, Allah referred to the sun and the moon to be revolving, each in a certain orbit. And he is who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon, each in an orbit floating. It is mentioned in another verse too, the sun is not static, it moves in an orbit. And the sun runs on its fixed course for a term. That is the decree of the Almighty, the All-Knowing. According to the calculation of astronomers in the late century, the Sun is traveling at the enormous pace, 720,000 km in an hour, in the direction of the star Vega, in a particular orbit called the solar apex. Scientific facts in the Quran are many. Baby construction, fingerprint, expansion of the skies, pressure reduction going up to the skies, many things that would need a lot of time to mention. But the main clear fact among all of them is that having them mentioned more than 1400 years from now must grab our attention to the knower of all who had sent them all to us in the Quran. Say, we believe in Allah, and that which has been sent down to us, and that which has been sent to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and to the tribes. 
and that which has been given to Moses and Jesus, and that which has been given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and to him we have submitted. In order to be a Muslim, you have to believe in all messengers sent by Allah. All are equal, with all respect. They all receive the same one message. Worship God alone and not associate partners with Him. If anyone wants to deliver something precious, definitely he will choose the best trustworthy person to do that. So, when Almighty God chooses someone to carry His message, wouldn't He choose the best among the human beings? That is why Muslims believe that the messengers are the best human beings. They do not commit major sins, but none of them is divine. Even Jesus, peace be upon him. Muslims believe that he is a messenger like all other messengers, and he is coming back. Let's think of God's great abilities of creating whatever he wants. Human offspring is regularly decided by God to count on both male plus female, mother and father, like all of us, while his decision for their beginning was to create one without mother or father, like Adam. He also decided to create another without a mother, and she became Eve. And he decided to create another without a father, and he became Jesus. Surely the likeness of Jesus before Allah is the likeness of Adam. He created him from dust. Then he said to him, Be, and he became. According to all of which we cleared up till now, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, cannot be the founder of Islam. Islam is the religion Allah sent to human beings ever since Adam was created through any of his prophets, peace be upon them all. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last messenger. He received the last message. He taught people his sunnah or his deeds and saying, which are considered the second source of Islamic knowledge and legislation after Quran. This man lived for 40 years among his people where he was known as the trustworthy and the truthful. For Muslims, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not just a prophet. He's the most beloved person ever. Most Muslims memorize many of his sayings by heart. They consider his teaching as the best way of life, as it has a fingerprint in almost every detail in our life. None of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. Say what is true, although it may be bitter and displeasing to people. He who eats his fill while his neighbor goes without food is not a believer. Powerful is not he who knocks the other down. Indeed, powerful is he who controls himself in a fit of anger. He is the most perfect Muslim whose disposition is the best. And the best of you are they who behave the best to their wives. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not only teach people how to pray and fast, he taught them as well how to conduct a balanced society. As Islam is a way of life that cares for the individual as much as it cares for the community competence. He gained Muslim hearts by the knowledge of how much he suffered to deliver the message and how much he resisted all the tempting offers. They tried to bribe him. The seniors of Quraysh offered him all the luxuries. They told him, if you want to be our king, we will make you our king. If you want to be rich, we will give you money up till you become one. If you like women, we will give you many to have, much more than any one of us. He answered saying, Even if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand in order to quit this issue, 
I will not until I convey the message or until I get destructed for that. He bore a lot to offer freedom for others, like women and slaves. Before his arrival, women were personal belongings of men. The society downgraded them and treated them as second-class citizens who have no rights. While according to the Prophet's teaching, women abuse became condemned. He gave them the right to divorce men, inherit, gain education, keep their identity, possessions, and their public life. He gave the best example in every role. Every Muslim would consider Prophet Muhammad as his mentor, either as a father, husband, teacher, merchant, lawyer, negotiator, or a politician. His love and respect expanded to even non-Muslims during the 20th century, who said in their own words, Michael Hart in his book The Greatest Hundred Influential Figures said, My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others, but he was the only man in history who was successful on both the religious and secular levels. It is the unparalleled combination of secular and religious influence which I feel entitles Muhammad to be considered the most influential single figure in human history. Alphonse de Lamartine, in his book Histoire de la Turquie, said, If greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are three criteria of human genius, who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? The very famous German poet Goethe said, he is a prophet and not a poet, and therefore his Quran is to be seen as a divine law and not as a book of a human being made for education or entertainment. And the man of peace Gandhi said, I became more than ever convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his interpretity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and his own mission. These, and not the sword, carried everything before them and surmounted every obstacle. When I closed the second volume of the Prophet's biography, I was sorry there was no more for me to read of that great life. Muslims believe that all people will be held accountable by God, all in the real flesh and blood, on a final day, where all deeds will be measured, the goods versus the bads, where on that day people will know where their final destination should be. Paradise or hell? Yet still, the justice of God as well as His mercifulness will be of great importance on that day. The last believers believing in the divine destiny. Every Muslim believes that Almighty God has full knowledge of everything that happens, even before it happens. This doesn't mean that He influences our decisions, but it means it's just a pre-knowledge. It can be described in a manner of a family when a mother offers her kid a bar of chocolate and a piece of cucumber. She almost knows what is he going to choose, but she doesn't interfere in his decision. When it comes to God, the all-knowing, his knowledge is expected to be higher and much more certain. Allah has full control of everything that happens, the good and the evil, and his knowledge is of all.
Muslims apply five obligatory deeds in their lifetime. They're considered as the five pillars of Islam. Those pillars are the testimony, praying, almsgiving, fasting the month of Ramadan, and pilgrimage. We will go through each in details. I bear witness, there is no deity worthy to worship but Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. By these words, with true belief from the heart, the one saying them is considered a Muslim. But what does this mean? I bear witness, there is no deity worthy to worship but Allah. It means freedom. It means that. None to worship except him. None to fear except him. None to hope in except him. None to ask except him. None to complain to except him. This is the same worshipping that Allah required all humanity to practice ever since the creation of human beings. Say, O oh people of the book, come to common terms, as between us and you, that we worship none but Allah, that we associate no partners with Him, and that none of us shall take others as lords beside Allah. Some may question, why does a Muslim say that Muhammad is his messenger? And you've just said that Muslims believe in all messengers of Allah. True. And the acknowledgement of the last prophet is an acknowledgement to all prophets. As it includes the meaning of saying and that Noah is the messenger of Allah and that Ibrahim is the messenger of Allah and that Jesus and Moses are the messengers of Allah. Peace be upon them all. On any pure spot, a Muslim must fulfill five prayers per day, each on time. The first is with dawn, then at noon, then at the afternoon, then by sunset and last at night. Prayers are not just actions without meanings. Every Muslim knows that. To stay a healthy human being, you need to feed your soul as much as you feed your body. Like three main meals a day and two snacks is good for your body regime. Five prayers is the best regime to keep your soul in touch with its creator all through the day. While directing faces to Mecca towards Al Kaaba, a Muslim would feel the sense of unity as on every spot on earth there must be someone else here or there or some elsewhere directing his face to the same direction worshipping the same one God in the same manner. It is the sense of unity that is not limited to certain lands or boundaries. Muslims fall by their faces on earth worshipping Almighty God, reviving the prophetic tradition of all biblical prophets like Abraham, Moses, Aaron and Jesus that people forgot. Five percent of any cash savings held for one year. Five to ten percent of any agriculture income and twenty percent of any extracted resources and minerals. These amounts of money are considered the right of the poor over the rich. Islam is establishing a community in which compliance is of a paramount importance. The capable must help the uncapable. Allah offers money for the rich to touch them in their manners, generosity, and piety. As much as in poverty, He tests the poor in their acceptance, patience, and piety. Some may think that how would giving away money means the growth of money. Well, I would prefer to leave this answer to the leaders of the CSR, newly developed science, that builds its theory on that corporate social responsibilities should pay money for charity that will end up in the growth of the corporate fortune.
according to the lunar calendar, in the ninth month called Ramadan. From dawn up till sunset, Muslims practice fasting. They don't eat, they don't drink, and they don't do sexual intercourse. Good manners, patience, and preservance through discipline should be the outward frame of human interaction. By sunset, they relax. They eat, they drink, they fulfill their needs. Then by dawn, they host. They don't eat, they don't drink, and they don't do sexual intercourse. By sunset, they relax again. By dawn, they hold. Relax, hold. What does this look like? An exercise? Yes, it is an animal training for Muslims. They train to be in full control of their physical needs and desires. Obligatory for once in a lifetime. For those who are capable, pilgrimage should be done. On the same spot of earth, in the same dressing code, acting with the same rituals, Muslims meet in millions from different places, different cultures, different languages, and different levels, but nothing to differentiate between them, as they all are here to worship the same one, and only God. That sense of universality, the sense of being all one, worshipping one, is what grabbed the attention of Malcolm X, the American black Muslim who used to join a group of extremists that believed that whites are devils. 11 days in the Muslim world, the man said in his own words, Now you may be shocked by these words, but I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, and prayed to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were blue, whose hair was blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. And we were all brothers, true, people of all colors and races believing in one God, in one humanity. There is no superiority for an Arab over a non-Arab, nor for a non-Arab over an Arab, neither for the white over a black, nor for a black over a white, except in piety. 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 piety.